In this video, we're going to demonstrate the RS Logix 5000 software used to program the Control Logix and Compact Logix line of uh, Allen Bradley PLCs. Right here, we have our Control Logix uh, processor and rack. It's a 17 slot rack, the slot 0, and then 16 slots for the I.O. Has a Logix 5550 processor in there, and we've got a, an array of different I.O. cards. Today we're going to be building a very, very simple demonstration program, primarily to show you how you configure the rack for the I.O. cards, and basically just get ready to start doing ladder logic programming. Let's come back here. I've got the software opened up, and I will be contrasting this against the older versions of Allen Bradley software, the RS Logix 500, and also the MicroLogix software packages. Like those, it uses RS links to establish communications between the uh, PLC and the computer you're using to do the programming. So right here, I, you can see I've got a serial link set up, a DF1 link, and we have our processor right there, and I had a program in there called Tony00 Hello World. Um, I'm going to overwrite that program, create a brand new one. <coughs> I just wanted to show you that RS Links is set up and running, and that will have to be done before you do any programming in your PLC. So here we go. I'm going to create a new project. So. I get to choose which type of controller it is. Uh, we already are set up here for a 5550 controller, Rev13. Chassis type, 17 slot chassis. We also have options here. We happen to have a 17 slot, so that's what we do. And slot zero, I get to choose which slot the processor goes into. It's kind of a new feature. Um, with the older uh, Slick 500 PLCs, processor had to be in uh, slot zero. Here, I could put the processor in any slot that I want, but just out of tradition, I'm gonna keep it in slot zero. And then I choose the directory under which I want to create the project. And of course, I got to give it a name. In uh, true programming <coughs> convention, I'm going to call my first program Hello World. That's usually what a programmer calls their very first program. Just a simple demonstration program to show how to get the thing up and running. It's not going to do anything practical. There we go. Click OK. It's busy thinking about what it wants to do. And it's going to bring up a window over here, a pane where you get to see the various aspects of the controller, including the program, main routine right here, and currently there is no program. There's nothing here for us to, to look at or to edit. <coughs> we have to do some more configuration first. What I'm going to do here is go into I.O. configuration. We need to tell it what cards are in the rack. So a brand new module. We're going to pan the camera up here. <coughs> Take a look at our first module, which happens to be an AC output right here. I can swing this door open. This is a model 1756-OA16. It's an AC triac type output module. And it is in slot 0, 1, 2. So slot 2 right here for that module is going to go. So we come down here and we select the 1756-OA16 out of this enormous list. Right there. Click OK. Major revision 2. I know that happens to be correct for this uh, IO module. I have to give the module itself a name. This is going to be important for some applications. I'm going to call this AC Output. I can even give the module a description if I wish. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, revision level, uh, 2.1. Uh, that's okay. And then electronic keying. I can tell the software whether this module has to be an exact match for what's going on here, if it doesn't care at all, or if it just has to be compatible. I'm going to stick with the default of compatible. And of course, I have to choose a slot number. In this case, it is slot number 2, as we counted before. It was in slot 2, a couple spaces over from the processor in slot 0. I go to Next, <coughs> and I can choose a couple options here, whether or not to inhibit the module, and whether or not to go on a, a switch the controller to a major fault if there's a connection that's failing while it's in run mode. And then I've got a few module properties. I go to Next. Now, this is a really, really cool feature, very different from what we saw on the Slick 500. Here, I get to choose what the outputs will do in various states of the processor. Now, of course, when the processor is running, the outputs will do whatever the user program tells it to do. But here, we have some interesting options. When the processor is in program mode, I can tell these uh, points what to do. And the default condition is off. So I could, for example, tell it to hold its last state, <coughs> or I could tell it to default to the on mode or the off mode when the processor switches to program. That's a really cool feature because uh, the older generations of, uh, of the PLC, the output simply turned off when the processor went to program mode. Here I've got some other options. Ditto with fault mode. 
if the processor detects a fault condition. In other words, it's running, but it's faulted. There's some problem that has been detected. I can likewise tell these outputs what to do. By default, the option is to turn off. However, if I want to, I can tell them to hold their last state or to go on. This could be important, I should say it is important for safety. If your machine is being controlled or your process is being controlled by a PLC, you want to be able to specify what those I.O. channels will do in the event of a uh, program mode switch or a fault detected. Next I go here, <coughs> and uh, let's see, a couple of other pieces of information, then I say finish, and there we go. Now I have a brand new card in slot two, a new module in slot two, AC output. Well, I need an input card here for my Hello World program, so new module, pan back, back up here. My AC input card happens to be in slot nine. It's a 1756-IA16, it's an AC input card, 16 channels. Come down here and select from this vast list, IA16, right there, major revision two, which I know is correct. We have to give this a name as well. I could give it a name according to some feature of my process, like maybe push button switches or limit switches or whatever that would be descriptive of the devices hooked up to it. In this case, I'm just going to call it AC input. Likewise, I could put in a full description if I wanted to as well. Revision 2.1, that's fine. Compatibility mode, cool. Slot number, I need slot number 9. That's the slot that we saw it was in. Next, I can inhibit. I can tell it to uh, create a major uh, fault if the connection fails. And then here I've got options to enable change of state, able to detect off to on or on to off. I can select that. By default, these are all checked. Normally, I want this to be able to detect all transitions of the input. And then I can also select uh, filter times, uh, off to on, on to off. I can select variable amounts of uh, filter time that the card uses to filter the signals. And finish. So I'm done with that. So I've got two modules in slot two and slot nine, respectively. AC output, AC input. Now I go to main routine, double click on that, and here is my palette for programming a ladder logic user program. <coughs> so I'm going to start editing this. I'm going to drag over a contact, contact instruction, and I'm going to right click right here and say new tag. Now, one of the major differences between the Logix 5000 programming software and the old versions is everything is tag name based. Gone are the days where we address inputs and outputs by I colon whatever, whatever. Uh, here we actually create tag names, which becomes a very useful and powerful way to define variables in the program. New tag. I have to give this tag a name. Now this is going to come from a real life discrete input, so I'll call this push button switch, so maybe start switch. I can also give it a full description, a paragraph description if I wish. This connects to a real-world push-button switch with NO contacts. There we go. <coughs> then I get to select the tag type. The base type refers to an internal variable in the PLC's memory. An alias, which is what I'm going to choose here, refers to uh, an alias for real I.O. So here, if I pull down the alias, it shows me here's all the different things that this name, start switch, could be an alias for. <coughs> the closest uh, analog to this in the old world of Slick 500, we call this a symbol. We give a symbol to a particular input or output address. In this case, though, we call it a tag name, and we have a lot more flexibility with how we reference those tag names to various places of memory in the PLC. So remember, this is for a start switch. This is an input, and our input card was on slot 9. When we go down here to our tag names, it shows the uh, physical addresses here of the various cards. We know that slot 9 is our uh, input card, our analog input. We have a couple of different sets of variables, one with a C, one with an I. The I refers to input, and the C refers to configuration. So here I want the I. I can expand that. And I've got uh, fault information and also data right here. I want the data. This is going to be the actual bits turned on and off by switches connecting to the inputs. Notice I get a pull down menu right there. That's where I get to select which bit on that card is going to refer uh, to the tag name start switch. So let's say that I, um, which channel I should say, 
let's say that I select uh, channel 5 or bit 5 in that word. So there we go. I click OK. And there is my um, examine if closed instruction right there that has a hardware referenced address local colon 9 colon i dot data dot 5. <coughs> Again, that means local chassis, slot 9, input, data, and um, bit number 5 of that 32 bit word. So, next step, I'm going to put a coil in here to complete my very simple Hello World program. The coil likewise has to have its own tag name, its own reference in memory. So, right click, new tag, and I'm going to call this, um, let's see, motor jog. <coughs> and I could give this a description, a whole paragraph description if I wanted to. This output channel connects to a contactor coil to drive a motor. And I'm going to choose it as an alias again. It's not going to be an internal uh, bit in memory. It's going to be an alias for real life IO point. Remember, this goes to the output card, which, is, if you recall, is in slot number two. So notice I've got a few different listings here for local two. Here is uh, configuration, input, and output. Now, configuration, of course, holds data rel relevant to that card's configuration. This is an output card, but it still has a set of input variables. This is basically monitoring the fuse states for that, analog or that discrete output card. I want the actual output bit, so I'm going to choose this one right here, local chassis, slot 2, output bit. I've got data right here. Notice the pull-down menu that appears. I get to select the bit of this card, the particular channel on the output card that's going to be driven by that coil instruction. I'll select bit number 8 just for fun. And I'll click OK. So there we go. There's my simple program. I can do a syntax check. And it clears the check OK. So we're looking at a um, examine of closed instruction with the hardware address reference right there, my tag name, and the description. And then over here, a coil instruction, uh, output enable coil, with hardware address reference, my tag name, and another description. Of course, at this point, I need to download this program to the controller. So here we go, download. Failed to go online. OK, it needs to know the communications path. So go to communications, who's active. It references the data in RS links. I want the serial link right here. I want that controller. I'm going to say download. And we wait. done. Change control back to remote run. Sure. So I'm back in remote run. You can see the green power right here. So it's ready to go. This is a running operating program. My very simple hello world program is actually running. At this point in time, I do not have a real world switch hooked up to channel 5 of that card in slot 9. So to make this program run, I'm going to have to force the bit. And I can do that just like I could in the uh, Slick 500 software. I can right click and say force on. I can force that input bit to the on state. Then I come up here to forces and I will enable all the IO forces. Enable forces, yes. And notice when I do that, that colors, that colors as well, meaning that bit is being forced and sending data to that coil instruction. So if I come over here to slot number two, We can see right there the little number eight. It's very, it's hard to, uh, to see, uh, the, but that eight is lit. If we keep the camera focused on that, I will remove the forces. And we should see that turn off. And yeah, the output's uh, channel eight's no longer on. So we remove the forces and that channel turned off. So back to this. We have ourselves a running program and uh, hopefully a better understanding of what you'd have to go through to configure this and get it to work. Uh, remember, we had to uh, tell the software what sort of controller we were dealing with, which slot the processor was in. We had to configure modules, what types of modules, what slots they're in, and the various states that would be allowed during uh, program mode or fault mode. 
then when we came up here and started writing our, our program itself, the user program, we'd come up uh, here <coughs> and uh, right click on the instruction, and then create a tag name, and then reference that tag name to the real world I.O. So there's some interesting differences between this and the older generation Slick 500 software or MicroLogix software. Uh, very powerful stuff here, lots of features. We have just barely scratched the surface of this software, but I wanted to shoot this introductory video to give you a taste of what life is like in the brave new world of the RS Logix 5000.